Praise the Lord God's children. Welcome to the Master's Touch Evensong service. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you and continually glorify you, O Lord. My friends, did you come expecting to receive tonight? Well, if you if you didn't come expecting to receive anything from the Lord, elevate your expectation level and open your hearts to receive Him because you'll come away with a better head and heart connection and a better revelatory connection, and you'll get a better understanding of God's Word. Now, as we begin our worship tonight, take a second to assemble a small piece of bread, cracker, or some sort of a bite of food, and a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice. It can even be water. Just gather those things and set them aside. Later on, we're going to pray over them, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. Let's begin by inviting the Holy Spirit to join us, shall we? Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, we enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. They're just open wide, expecting to receive your word and your revelation knowledge. Our worship, love, gratitude, and devotion for you is flowing freely from our hearts through our lips. And we love you, we magnify you, and praise your precious holy name. We thank and praise you that we believers are seated in heavenly places in Christ, that we abide in the secret place of the Most High. And we thank you that your word tells us that you've already heard our prayers. We thank you that your word says that all of your answers for the believer's prayers are yes and amen. And we thank you for the gifts of utterance, the rhema word of God, the logos word of God, impartation and revelation knowledge. We thank you that the healing power of God is present to heal all who come to you in faith and in need. We give you thanks and praise for your only begotten Son and His finished work on the cross on our behalf. And we thank you that we are totally healed, made whole, and completely restored. And we give you all the honor, glory, and praise in the name above all names, the matchless name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Right now, uh, let's worship our King. She's got more month than she's got money Works three jobs, she's barely getting by Bob got a word, his mom's been told it's cancer So many questions and all of them ask why We're living in a broken world a broken world won't give you any answers Everything is upside down Wrong is right and right is wrong But not for long No, not for long This broken world is cradled by our Savior and Nothing here can take him by surprise Someday all this hurting will be over And every tear's been wiped away and dry But for now we're living in a broken world But not for long No, not for long Spends her waking hours praying Her child's done, gone, left everything behind Daddy's getting tired, his faith is fading You can't get water from a well that's running dry We're living in a broken world and a broken Not 
climbs the hill that bears the cross, that takes the nails. What kind of love is this that takes my place, that gives his life and clears my name? Oh, oh, I want to know what kind of love this is.
Well, we're on the threshold of the throne room of God Almighty. And in order to enter in and receive in that place, we must go into the spirit to an even deeper depth. The door to that depth is soaking in worship, so soak with me right now. May my words be yours and your words be mine in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3. Now faith is the assurance, substance of things hoped for, the conviction, evidence of things not seen. For by it the men of old received divine approval. <clears throat> by faith, we understand that the world was created by the word of God, <coughs> so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. Now, adding the more accurate meanings of the Greek words in this verse, we can paraphrase Hebrews 11.1 1 as, Faith is a substantiation of things hoped for, the rebuttal, the rebuke, or the reproof of things not seen. The word substantiation is a word that is used only three times in the Greek New Testament, and all three times it occurs in the book of Hebrews. It's a Greek word, hypostasis, and it occurs first in the Hebrews, in chapter 1, verse 3, who bring the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, hypostasis, and upholding all things by the word of power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God on high. Now, here's where the word hypostasis occurs. Speaking about Jesus the Christ, who is the brightness of the glory and the expressed image of his hypostasis, all that's capitalized. It's interesting that the same word translated as substance in Hebrews 11, 1 is translated as person in Hebrews 1, verse 3. The verse says that Jesus is the very expressed fullness, detail, and precise image of God's person, using the word God's hypostasis or substance. So the word substance or substantiation refers to the actual being, nature, character, image, fullness, personality, makeup, or blueprint. And Jesus is that very substantiation or very hypostasis of who God is. Now, applying the varied meanings of hypostasis to Hebrews 11.1, 1, it tells us that faith is the very substance, the blueprint, the image, the precision in detail of the things hoped for. The difference is that the things hoped for are in the spirit world. Now, I'm sure all of us would never question the fact that Jesus Christ is the very fullness of the Father in His very image, in every detail of His personality. Jesus is, in every way, like the Father. 
And Jesus said that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You see that Jesus is the exact replica, the exact duplicate, if not the very image and fullness of the Father. So faith is the substantiation of things hoped for. It's the vehicle that opens the door to the supernatural and allows the truth, which is God's perfect plan and will, to enter into the natural and establish, substantiate itself here. Faith has its very blueprint, its very detail in the spiritual world. Now, this is what faith does. It opens the way, then sees it. It conceives it in precise detail. I'm talking about details, not generalities here. Jesus is not just the general image of God. Jesus is the precise duplicate, the complete fullness of God. And faith is the hypostasis, the substantiation of things that are hoped for. Faith is the precise detailed blueprint of what we hope for. So, to exercise faith, it has to be in detail. Now, Hebrews 3, verse 14 says, For we are partakers of Christ, if only we hold the beginning of our confidence, hypostasis, steadfast to the end. It's, isn't it interesting that in the same book of Hebrews, one Greek word, hypostasis, is translated into three different English words? What inconsistency. I mean, hypostasis is translated as person in Hebrews 1, 3. In Hebrews 3, 14, it's translated as confidence. And in Hebrews 11, 1, as substance. <laughs> Come on. They're all referring to the same thing. Let's use the word blueprint or substantiation. In Hebrews 3, it says that we must hold fast to that beginning of our hypostasis, and that's the process of faith that I'm speaking to you about. Now, when you believe God for something, you begin to see the image, the hypostasis, the blueprint that comes from God on high, and there is a beginning and there is an end. Now, the Word of God says hold fast to the beginning of the hypostasis, the blueprint. So let's say that a napkin is a spiritual cloth that exists inside the spiritual realm. In the natural, you want to produce the physical substance of the exact color, exact dimension, exact substance of this spiritual cloth. The cloth represents the spiritual world. Anything outside the cloth represents the natural world. So the spiritual world cannot be touched by the natural senses. So if we want to produce something in the natural, we have to have the hypostasis, the blueprint, of the napkin first in the spiritual realm. So as you meditate on God's word, that will begin to give you the image or hypostasis or blueprint of this spiritual cloth. Now, as you're meditating on the word, you're substantiating or giving substance to this image. In time to come, the hypostasis, the blueprint of this spiritual cloth, will manifest itself in the physical realm, the natural realm. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to be teaching you on the limitations of faith in the upcoming messages because in acquiring faith through teaching, it's imperative that we get the correct understanding. The reason is that faith is so powerful that unless you understand what faith cannot do, you may misapply it. And this is why I'll cover the areas you can't exercise faith for or where the limitations of faith are. And once you understand where faith is limited, you'll know the other areas where faith is not limited. And you can launch fully into it and learn to bring and lay hold of the spirit world and all it has to offer. Now, unless you get a hold of this hypostasis, this blueprint, you'll be unable to get things manifested. Things become more clear as you look more deeply into the spiritual world. Look, Moses saw the pattern of the tabernacle one revelation by one revelation. This has been the consistent plan that, and the way that God has operated throughout the Bible. For example, if God is revealing the future to you, he will show you the actual scene in the spirit world. Kenneth Hagin describes that in his book, I Believe in Visions. In his vision about the last call for America, he saw a horseman coming to him. And he wrote, when the horseman came to me, he pulled on the reins and stopped. I stood on his right. He passed the scroll from his left hand to his right hand and handed it to me. As I unrolled the scroll, which was a roll of paper 12 to 14 inches long, he said, take and read. At the top of the page, in big, bold black print, were the words, war and destruction. I was struck dumb. He laid his right hand on my head and said, read in the name of Jesus Christ. I began to read what was written on the paper, and as the words instructed me, I looked and saw what I had just read about. First I read about thousands upon thousands of men in uniform. Then I looked and saw these men marching uh, in a wave after wave of soldiers marching as to war. I looked at the direction they were going, and as far as I could see, there were thousands of men marching. I turned to read the scroll again and then looked and saw what I had just read about. I saw many women, old women with snowy white hair, middle-aged women, young women, and teenagers. Some of the younger ones held babies in their arms. All the women were bowed together in sorrow and were weeping profusely. I looked at the scroll again, and again I looked to see what I had read about. 
I saw the skyline of a large city. Looking closer, I saw the skyscrapers were burned out hulls. Portions of the city lay in ruins. It was not written that just one city would be destroyed, burned and in ruins, but that there would be many such cities. And he continues reading the scroll, and it was something about revival, and then he saw the revival. So what's the point? Well, he read and he saw part by part. The principle behind the experience that Kenneth Hagin had is that things must take place in the spiritual realm before they can materialize in this physical world. This is the basis of faith as well. You must have the substance in the spiritual realm before you can see it manifested in the physical world. Faith is the substantiation in the natural realm of the spiritual substance of the things hoped for. So, in the spiritual world, there is a beginning of the hypostasis, the blueprint, and there is an end. And we can substantiate this statement by Scripture, Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus is the author of all faith, not ourselves. And in the Scriptures, the word our is in italics, which means it was put there by the translators to give clarity. But the truth is that when you take that italicized word our out of the reading of the Scripture, the truth comes forth looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith. So Jesus is the author of all faith and the finisher of all faith, not ourselves. Now in the midst, uh, so I was going to say, so uh, the most important thing about the thing that we are exercising faith for is to ask, is it the will of God? Even if it is the will of God, it takes a lot to bring it to pass. We're going to look at that process of faith. Some people say, <clears throat> excuse me, some people say if it's God's will, it will just come to pass. Well, let me tell you something. If it's God's will, it takes people to believe it, to hold fast to it, to birth it, and then it takes dedication. So that it's the beginning of hypostasis and Hebrews 3 says hold fast to the beginning of it. The moment you see what's in the spiritual world, you hold fast to it. And as you hold fast to it, it gathers more details. And you begin to see more and more and more of it. And you begin then to pull it into the natural realm. Hold fast the beginning of it. It begins with a little of the hypostasis, a little of the blueprint. And as you hold fast, you gain more hypostasis or more of the blueprint becoming manifested. As you hold fast to the beginning of the hypostasis, the blueprint, you will gradually see the complete whole. And suddenly the hypostasis, that blueprint, is completely manifested here in the natural. The two are closely related. Hold fast the beginning of the, of the image, the very substance the blueprint that you see in the spirit, spiritual, <laughs> and it will manifest and operate in the natural. Let's look at Hebrews 11, 1 again. Now faith is the assurance, hypostasis or blueprint, of things hoped for. The evidence, rebuttal of stubborn natural false narrative to establish the reality, the real truth, of things that are not seen. The word evidence, as we discussed in previous lessons, carries a stronger meaning than simply just the word evidence. It's the same Greek word that speaks about rebuke and rebuttal. It's a rebuttal by the truth from the spiritual realm, pushing into the natural realm to establish itself. So it's the spiritual realm taking the natural by force. It's the spiritual realm coming forth and rebutting what's there, causing it to conform to the image of God. And when God said, light be, in Genesis 1, the light came forth and literally rebuked or rebutted the darkness. In other words, light came in like a bolt of lightning and tore into the darkness, causing it to scatter and light to fill the atmosphere around and in the earth. Now, when God said, let life come forth from the earth, the life literally came forth and rebutted the lifelessness that was there. Faith works together with some other forces as well, and we see the whole process of how it works in Hebrews 6, verse 12. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So there's three things at work here, the promise, faith, and patience. Faith and patience work together to cause the promise to be inherited. Faith and patience cause the promises of the uh, word of God to be manifested in the natural. Faith must work with patience. They are the power twins. The word patience is interesting. It's the Greek word hupomon, which consists of two Greek words combined together. One is Greek, the Greek word hupo, which means upon, and the other is the Greek word mano, which means abide. So the same word mano is used by Jesus in John chapter 13 when he says, abide in me and let my word abide in you. He says, mano in me and let my word mano in you. Now patience is not what we think it is here in this natural. Patience is not just hanging in there with something until it happens. Patience in the Bible is a strong force, and it means abiding upon. So patience, hupomon, means to abide, and the whole and, and the world. I'm I'm sorry, not world. The word 
And the word mano is always used together with the word of God. All right. In other words, there's no true abiding without the word of God. So patience means to stand upon something, to stand upon the word of God and let it remain the same in season and out of season. Patience is maintaining the same position, come what may. You maintain the same position of faith in the word. It's not a position of doubt, not a position of grumbling and complaining or groaning. Patience is holding to what is hoped for tightly and fast. It's like getting into a boat and speeding through the waves that come continually at you. It conveys a steady movement. Faith and patience inherit the promises of God. And there's uh, another word for patience, and there are two words translated patience in the Greek that bring very strong forces into play. Next week, I'm going to read some scriptures, and we'll compare it and see the fullness of it. Okay? All right. So now that you have that, because this is a really long lesson, and it's a lot in it, I don't want to overkill, you know, and give you too much so that you can't, can't uh, keep it in perspective. You know, but right now, Listen, my friends, this may be your time. This may be the moment for you appointed by God to make a decision for Christ. So listen, if the Lord is speaking to your heart today, if you desire to come into the kingdom of God and dwell in the miraculous presence of our Lord Jesus, the Savior, if you desire to be in Christ, become a child of God and avail yourself of his marvelous wisdom and power, if you desire to walk closely with God, you must give your life to him. It's very simple and pain-free. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you that opportunity. If you had not come, tender baby king, and humbly left your throne to reach someone like me. If you had not walked upon this broken ground, where on earth would I be now? If you
this manger king, my everything. Love came for me. You know, if you'd like to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, sincerely with heartfelt repentance, come before the Lord with a contrite heart, which means a crushed, crippled, and a broken heart. Pray with me and receive Jesus, as Christ, Jesus the Christ as your Lord and Savior as you repeat this prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and set me free for all eternity from all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and sit at the right hand of God the Father. Take over my life and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I renounce the devil and all sin. And Lord, I receive from you the gift of righteousness, total forgiveness of all my sin, past, present, and future, divine health, wholeness, and restoration, your protection, direction, your provision, your peace, and the gift of everlasting life. I'm yours. Come into my heart and take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me and believe what you've prayed, then you're saved. Welcome to the family of God. Rejoice. Praise Father, Son. Praise Father, Son. Praise Father, Son. And Holy Ghost. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the
You know, one of the wonderful things that we receive from taking Holy Communion is healing of our bodies and minds. And we have to prepare before taking it. In that preparation, there's something you need to understand about our use of the elements of the covenant. Jesus and his disciples had bread and wine on the table when they shared the Last Supper, just like they had for years and years and years while they uh, celebrated the Passover. They used that for the ceremony. And because those particular items were used to draw the picture that Jesus wanted them to see, we use those same items. Now, I just want you to remember this. That doesn't mean that, that uh, you have to use those particular food items. If you don't have them, use what you have available. It's perfectly acceptable. Why? Because we pray over those items, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. So what you need to see in this is that they become that body and blood of Christ. Now, the Word of God tells us that the first thing that we have to do is discern the body of Christ. We do that by acknowledging that the bread or whatever food item you're using as the body of Christ is the vibrancy of the life of Jesus. His supernatural healing and wholeness, that because of his body and blood, you supernaturally have become bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of Jesus' flesh. That you're now filled with his perfection and power, completely healed, completely made whole. You know, you are completely restored actually to divine health, his divine health. So you could think of it like a medicine, like a pill. That's glowing with the Shekinah glory of God. Every time you take that medicine, it's healing you as it travels through your mouth down into your body. And as it goes, it's pushing out all darkness, which is sickness and disease. And it's pushing it out from the inside out. Visualize the condition that you're plagued with being on Jesus' body. Put what ailments are that you're suffering from on him. Use your imagination because you're not giving him something he doesn't want. He already took it at the cross, remember? So the enemy's trying to trick you into taking it by deceiving you into thinking that you've got it through lying symptoms. But since Jesus took it at the cross already, you've been healed and made whole at the cross. So put that lying symptom back on Jesus in the same place on him you've been afflicted. See yourself with the solution, my friends. See yourself without the problem. This is called spiritual visualization. It's vital you understand it and do it. Now, one of the things that um, I want, before I go on, I want to tell you about is that I had a vision that, the, that God gave me the other day of Jesus and I. We were, you know, doing regular household chores and this programs and different things like that, ministry. And I saw us, the way I saw us in this vision was like a hologram that I saw me. And then if I turned my head slightly, I saw Jesus over me in me, over me, through me, you know how a hologram does. And I kept, I was fascinated and he, we laughed all the time and we went places together and it was just great. And all the while he was in me and I was in him and we were never separated, just hologrammy. If you can see yourself that way, grab onto that vision and, and visualize yourself with that. It helps you with your spiritual visualization. Now, if you've been diagnosed with a problem and you're being treated by a doctor, then continue your treatment and medications, but add to it your faith and your taking of Holy Communion for healing and restoration. Listen, my friends, we believe in doctors, so don't just try to mentally agree your situations away. See a doctor and get a name for what's plaguing you, because everything with a name has to bow to the name of Jesus. The next thing we do in preparation is discern the blood of Christ. We discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future as restoration of the blessing to your life, and that's the power and authority of God in your life in full operation, as receiving God's provision and protection, as receiving the gift of righteousness from Jesus Christ, thanking God for his plan of redemption and that you've been included in it. Thank you that you have been given eternal life. Thank him for that and thank you that you've been given life everlasting and now you no longer live under the law. You live under his grace. Okay. Now lift up the elements of the covenant before the Lord. These are the items that I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program. Lift them up before the Lord as I pray. And listen, if you can't because you're incapacitated and can't lift your hand up uh, to hold them up, then put your hand over them like it, like a hovercraft, you know, just laying over the top of them. You don't have to touch them. Just, uh, just kind of hover over the top of them, okay? Now, <clears throat> let's pray. Father, we praise you as we worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten Son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this food item becomes his body, his healing body, and the vibrancy of his life within us. This is our portion of his healing body. We thank you that as we partake of that body of Christ, we become healed and made whole, completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we are continually washed in the waterfall of his blood and renewed within as we continually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen.
You know, the Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship. It's a partnership, actually, with Christ. And partaking of one bread uh, brings all the members together and the disciples together as well. And it merges us into one body, the church. The word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. Now that means continually take the bread, give thanks and break it and eat it, and then take the cup, give thanks and drink it, all while you're in the remembrance of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. The Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often, and yet Paul doesn't really give us any instruction as the frequency that the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated with. You know, he does imply, though, that it's to be done repeatedly. And the reason that he's leaving it open-ended is so that Partaking of the Lord's Supper will continually recall to our memory our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin, and we can do it as often as we want to and need to. Now listen, my friends. We are, as we are instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. Okay? Just give me a second here. All right. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you that this food item has become the bread of life and is now the healing body of our Lord Jesus the Christ. The body of our Lord Jesus broken for you, so that every cell, every tissue, every organ and bone, all systems, cardiovascular, neurological, blood vascular, lymphatic, autoimmune, gastrointestinal, urinary, muscular, skeletal, all systems are totally aligned with God's word and his will. That you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored to divine health and wholeness. In the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you that this beverage has become the precious saving blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you in celebration of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. For the remission of all of your sins, past, present, and future, and for the restoration of the empowerment of God, the blessing in your life and the gift of righteousness. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. Now see yourself without the problem, my friends. You know the Lord's Supper is a feast. It truly is a feast in union with the believers and the living Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits and are nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life. And for that, my friends, we are eternally grateful. Now, raise your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you open up your mouth and continually declare who you are in Christ Jesus, thanking God for all that you have received, and give honor, glory, and praise to the Lord Most High. May the Lord continually bless you with divine health and wholeness, and make your way prosperous as you walk in his love. In the name and majesty of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, we pray, amen. Go in peace and in God's love.